Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we are very excited about our guest today. We have the amazing Matt Harris. How are you today, Matt? I'm doing well. Thank you. Oh, great. And Matt is joining us from the lovely state of Colorado, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I live about not far from the U.S. Naval Academy. So oh, interesting. Uh, Air Force Academy. Or, oh, my word. It's been a long day, Landon. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I do not I live in New York. Moved to Colorado <laughs> or Maryland. I don't know the difference between any kind of academy. So I'll let you guys it's the Air Force that Academy. Out. <laughs> I don't live in Annapolis. Springs. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know where Matt lives. We're just going to start the podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> Too much time outdoors today. <laughs> Too much time up north. That's it. Okay, Landon, why don't we uh, read the bio for our wonderful guest today, and then we will dive right in. I guarantee that you guys are going to find this. Uh, probably different from things that we've podcasted about before, but very important and extremely interesting. So go ahead and read that bio, Landon. Okay. Matt Harris is a professor of history at Colorado State University, Pueblo, where he teaches classes on race and religion, civil rights, American legal history, and American religions. He is the author and or editor of seven books, including Watchmen on the Tower, Ezra Taft Benson, and The Making of the Mormon Right, uh, which is from University of Utah Press. His most recent book is titled Second Class Saints, Black Mormon and the Struggle for Racial Equality, which will be published by Oxford University Press in May 2024. Uh, Harris is on the board of the John Whitman Historical Association. He has given podcasts all over the world and frequently speaks to LDS audiences about race, the priesthood temple ban, Mormon extremism, and other topics. He earned his BA and MA from BYU and his uh, M. Phil and PhD, all in history from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. We also learned today that you uh, wrote one of the essays in the book that we're doing with uh, Backyard Professor. We're doing a series on it. Uh, uh, the Gospel Topics Gospel Essay Gospel Topic Essay Series, yeah. Yes. Isn't that funny? We we Googled your name on Amazon because we wanted to pull down some pictures of your books. In fact, Landon, if you want to share screen, we'll show that really quick. And I'm like, Landon, I think that Matt might have write, written an essay in this book. We are going through every single essay with the Backyard Professor. So we may be calling you when we get to your essay because we like to have the authors on to discuss. So yeah, we you're very prolific and, and that's just wonderful. So um, on the screen, you guys can see that we have um, pictures of... Two of his books, Ezra, Ezra Taft Benson, A Watchman on the Tower, Ezra Taft Benson, and The Making of the Mormon Right. And that one has been out for a little while. And that's the one we're going to be focusing on today. And then, of course, coming out soon. What month did we say that was? In May. In May. Coming out in May. Yeah. And I'm feeling like our book club is going to want to do something with this. Don't you think, Landon? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Black Mormons and the struggle for racial equality, second class saints. So yeah, these are such important topics and these are wonderful books. So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about we how we ended up here with Matt today. So as you know, we've been podcasting a lot about OUR, about Tim Ballard, about all of that. So last weekend we thought, oh my goodness, new stuff has come out. The amended claim, we've got to do another podcast. So we started kind of diving in. We started dissecting some of the new information and we just kind of went deeper and deeper. And we just started saying, you know, there, there's some concepts that I don't think a lot of people have hit in this that are more of overarching themes. Isn't that kind of how we looked at it, Landon, as we just kind of started working through? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, as we start reading the different blessings that he mm -hmm. got, the mm -hmm. different uh, things that he was teaching. Uh, we just kept coming back to, wow, this just, uh, there, there's an undercurrent here that uh, mm -hmm. we keep coming back to. And of course, uh, growing up with, uh, you know, Ezra Taft Benson as, mm -hmm. as the prophet when I was younger, you know, I knew these things. I'd heard these stories. I knew, knew about this Mormon nationalism mm -hmm. movement. Uh, John Bircher's, that kind of yeah. stuff. I always thought that was kind of the strange fringe. So when we started reading it coming from, you know, some of the really more prolific uh, people in Mormon, you know, the maybe not so much church leaders directly, but the Glenn Becks. And then when Glenn Beck uh, was, was supporting Tim, Tim Ballard, and all of a sudden you've got uh, uh, Brunson uh, coming out and supporting him. He calls Mike Lee, Mike Lee supporting him, Sean Ray as a support. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, this is way higher than I thought. I thought this it was, you know, a bunch of extremists out there. And it seems like 
a lot more people are bought into it. So uh, got me kind of uh a little upset actually <laughs> landon <laughs> had a had a, a metaphysical breakdown <laughs> that's right uh, <laughs> but rebecca came to my rescue and said oh no this have this has been yeah. for a long time uh you know with president with president benson and right. all of that and uh so we started looking at some of your uh work and some of the podcasts that you had put out and boy it's a it, it is a long history and it's a fascinating history uh, and I think we maybe are seeing a resurgence of, of you know, white Mormon nationalism. And so we wanted to kind of have a discussion on that and see, you know, where did this come from and, and how did we get to this point and how does that tie in with what we're seeing today? Yep. That's exactly right. So, yeah, and I, I'm a little bit older than Landon. So I, I my parents were absolutely, you know, Bensonites, Skousenites, Bircher Society. So to me, that's just how I was raised. I was raised knowing that Captain Moroni was in George Washington's tent, guiding the events of the Revolutionary War. You know, that was just part of it. It was Mormonism and it was, you know, our forefathers and it was the Constitution. It was all baked in together. So I think, Landon, you didn't have so much of that when you were growing up. But to me, that's just how I was raised. And I think in our conversations with Matt, you said that's kind of, that was your dynamic in your family too. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll just dive right into this and kind of go through some of the concepts in your book of this political evolution of Mormonism that I think today we're seeing um, in spades. <laughs> sure, yeah. So um, I, I was drawn to Benson because Benson was the church president when I went on my mission in the 80s. And I grew up hearing about Ezra Taft Benson, especially, and also Cleon Skousen, uh, Benson's close friend. My father uh, grew up in a small town in Arizona called Heber, and a very conservative community, probably 90%, 95% LDS. They love Benson and Skousen in Heber, Arizona. And so my father married my mother. He went on his mission to the New England States mission in the early 60s. And he met my mother there and don't tell anybody, you're not supposed to meet your spouse on your mission. <laughs> it's our secret. But anyway, he met my mother there and then they eventually married and they moved to, or they lived for the first handful of years of their marriage in Arizona, which is where a few of my siblings, including myself, were born. And then we moved to Maine when I was 10, which is where my mother's from. And so in my Maine ward growing up, you know, there were a couple of Skousen people, but but nothing like I'd ever experienced until I served a mission in Idaho. Mm. And then I really my the world was opened up to me about Skousen and Benson and right wing extremism. And even on my mission, I knew I knew these folks were conservative, but I didn't know I wouldn't have called them right wing extremists because I just didn't have the background at the time. And anyway, so I was on my mission and then I got to BYU which is where I did my undergraduate and my first master's degree. And then I started to learn about that um, Benson and Skousen were controversial. That was the first time that I really knew they were controversial. And I looked back at BYU on my mission experience and I sort of connected the dots and that, oh, okay, wow. I, I, I you know, I talking to brother so-and-so and one of the wards in Pocatello who loves Skousen. And I could sort of, I could see why he was controversial as a BYU student, but I couldn't see it at the time as on my mission. Anyway, just share a quick story. So I um, went to BYU and then um, married my wife in Provo, um, the Salt Lake Temple. Then we went to New York for graduate work. And I remember in, I was in church one day. <laughs> That's a funny story. My brother was, came to visit us, my younger brother, and he served his LDS mission in Nevada. And my brother was well aware, much more than I was in Idaho, my brother was well aware of right-wing extremism in his mission. And they were giving the missionaries, members were giving the missionaries scows and stuff all the time. So my brother was up on all of this stuff. Anyway, he came to visit uh, my wife and I in New York to stay with us. And we were in church and this brother got up and started talking in church. <laughs> and my brother whispers to me and he said, do you know where this guy's sermon is coming from and i said i have no idea he said skousen and i said okay he said no you don't understand he memorized the entire sermon from beginning to end 
Not one word of this guy's sermon was his own. It was all scousing. This 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 is a <laughs> it was a farmer who would drive his tractor and memorize things all day as he's driving his rows. So he would memorize all of these scousing talks and then give them as though they were his own. And because my brother was <laughs> familiar with this sermon, he recognized it right away. And he didn't have it on him, of course. And this is before the internet. But about two weeks later, he mailed the sermon to me. And sure enough, from beginning to end, even the testimony was not his. It was all scousing. <laughs> was this guy known as the greatest orator in your board? I'm guessing yes. I mean, he he yes, was because he would memorize things. And oh, my goodness. it was interesting. I was in the bishopric at the time. And so I shared it with the bishop. And the bishop just kind of rolls his eyes like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do about this? <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's anything in the church handbook that says you can't plagiarize a sermon. but <laughs> Or a testimony. Why not? <laughs> or a testimony even. I mean, literally, even to the start, the time where he stood up and said, my brothers and sisters, it's nice to be here today. That was scousing. Matt, was your family blacklisted by the church or something that you got called the Idaho and Nevada? I, and Nevada. And yeah. Well, OK. All right. So Utah, I can't think of it. That's a personal question. Landon. So, so I had um, well, I loved Idaho because I thought I was going to my I think my patriarchal blessing said that I was going to go so in foreign uh, to a foreign mission and preach the gospel to a place and to a people with whom I'm not familiar. And then I get Idaho. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're not that different. And so I was a little taken back by that because I thought I would go somewhere overseas. And anyway, but I loved Idaho. And for me, I, the food was great. You know, meat, potatoes kind of guy. That was easy. Yeah. You hear these horror stories of missionaries going to certain yeah. countries and getting tapeworm. And, yep. you know, I just had good old fashioned Idaho cooking. So anyway, I went to Idaho and my brother, who's a year and a half younger than me. So this is not the one in Nevada. He wrote me an email when I was at B or not an email. He wrote me a letter and he said, you'll never guess where I got my mission call. Idaho. Another. <laughs> and so my, <laughs> and the best part is about, oh, I don't know, a month and a half later, he wrote me another letter. You'll never guess who my trainer is. So a guy that I trained on my mission in Idaho trained my little brother. Oh, wow. so I got this at the beginning of his mission and my brother got him at the end of his mission. It's a dynasty now. It's an so. Idaho missionary dynasty. That is so funny. Oh, my God. And, and President course, Benson Idaho signed is... both of our, our mission assignments. I know oh, yeah. the home of Ezra Taft Benson, Whitney. Yes, oh, Whitney, we that's like right. That's that quite a bit. And you see the yeah. sign birthplace of yeah, there's a Ezra plaque. Taft Benson. So uh, you, you, you're right there in his home homeland. So. Did that well, here's a, here's a, a story. I was in Pocatello and we met a retired congressman named Ralph Harding, good Latter-day Saint guy. And he was a congressman from Idaho in the early 60s. And I had heard in my mission that he was controversial a little bit, but I didn't know why. And he was an older man when I knew him and met him. He's now dead. But anyway, when I started doing my Benson research years later, and I write about this in my, my Benson book, The Watchman on the Tower. I learned why he's controversial. Benson was part of the extremist John Birch Society. And this Democratic congressman from Idaho thought that, that Benson's extremism was harming the church. So this is Congressman Harding. And what was interesting about this is, is that Harding, Benson set Harding apart in 1949 for Harding's own mission. And by, by Harding's own standards, Benson was his favorite general authority. So when Harding became a congressman, Benson started to up the game. He was broadcasting the Burt stuff really heavily, including a controversial book called The Politician. And it was a Birch book written by its founder. And in The Politician was the most extraordinary claim that any person could make, which was that General Eisenhower, who was the president, who's a five-star general, the Birchers called him a communist. And Benson was touting this book. And what was really interesting about Benson touting the politician is that Benson had served for eight years in Eisenhower's cabinet. And now Benson's going around telling everybody his former boss is a communist. You can't make this stuff up. And so Congressman Harding, when, when Benson had given a talk at, Bur at a Birch Society meeting 
1962. The New York Times was there. The Washington Post were there. And he said at this talk, he hinted that Ike was a communist. And Benson had just left the cabinet. Anyway, so it made the New York Times and the Washington Post that, you know, former cabinet officer calls former boss a commie. I mean, big headlines. And Congressman Harding is furious with this. And so he he, he thinks this is harming the church. It's harming, you know, a lot of good people. And so he reaches out to Hubie Brown, who's a Democrat. He's a member of the first presidency. He's like one of those, you know, little games that you play with kids, you know, which one is not like the others with the round blocks yeah. and this. Well, that's Hugh Brown. <laughs> it's Hugh. He's, <laughs> he's from Canada. He's a he's a socialist. He is he's he's not from Utah, Idaho, Arizona, conservative Republican. He, he's I mean, the he's Dieter my, Uchtdorf of the day. <laughs> he is the Dieter Uchtdorf of the day, for sure. He is cut from a different cloth. Anyway, um, so Brown had been pushing back on Benson's extremism for a long time and and felt uh, frustrated that David O. McKay, the church president, wouldn't rein in Elder Benson. Anyway, Congressman Harding, recognizing he had an affinity with this first presidency counselor, he sent a letter to Brown. He said, look, I want to condemn Benson. Surely you've seen the New York Times article about him. I want to condemn him on the floor of the U.S. Congress. Do I have your blessing? Brown writes back and says, you'll do the church a great favor if you do this. And, <laughs> and so Harding, I mean, think about this for a moment. Just pause and stop and think. This is a former government official who's an apostle in the church saying that his former boss is a communist. The world knows about it. It's been published. And then the first presidency counselor is saying, you'll do the church a great service if you do this. But you're also criticizing the Lord's anointed, too, right? And so Harding recognizes that he's swimming in perilous waters. That's why he sought Brown's approval. And Harding also went to a state president for support, too. He said, look, I want to I want to I want to tear into Elder Benson on the floor of the Senate. Do I have your your blessing? And the president, uh, state president, a guy named Milan Smith says, oh, you, you have my blessing. I agree with President Brown. Go get him, Tiger. Milan Smith was not only the stake president, he was a top assistant in Eisenhower's cabinet. He worked for Benson. So all of this is local and personal. And so Milan Smith, who, who worked for Benson for eight years, somehow obviously felt that Benson's ideas were nutty and told Congressman Harding, a member of his ward and stake, that, hey, you can do this. So anyway... The upshot is Congressman Harding gives this rip roaring rebuke of Secretary Benson on the floor of the U.S. Uh, Congress. And of course, it makes the news. And Benson is furious. And he and his son and some other birchers, they lead a campaign in Idaho to get him unelected. And it works. Congressman Harding is not reelected. And the Bensons, both father and son, used the church card against Congressman Harding. Rather than just keeping it political, Elder Benson and Reed Benson, who was a member of the John Burt Society, his son was on the payroll as a regional coordinator. They, they had organized this massive protest against Congressman Harding. And the, the gist of it was that he's speaking ill of the Lord's anointed. You can't reelect him. Mm. I mean, they're really crossing all kinds of boundaries. Yeah. So anyway, Congressman Harding is only a, a one-termer. He's out after two years, and it cost him his political career. And he recognized that it, it might that might happen, and Brown even told him that. He said, if you do this, I support you, but if you do this, you should know that there might be consequences. And there, and there were. I didn't know um, this when I had dinner at his house. You only know, you're an insider. <laughs> you're an insider's insider. But obviously, the officials in the church need that to get out there because it harms the church. Does everyone in the church think that Eisenhower's a? I mean, you have to get it's that double edge. It's almost like a John D. Lee, right? Take one for the team. Tell everybody we don't believe this, but then we're going to have to, you know, make sure you're not elected again and you're going to be unpopular and controversial for the rest of your life. Wow, that is such an interesting story. That's I mean, people don't know these. This this book is going to be incredible so what influence i mean talk a little bit about just benson's influence like like i talked about my parents i mean he could do no wrong and everything that he said religiously and politically i mean i don't even think those are two separate words to people like my parents it was all intertwined together 
hard well, baked how, in. <laughs> yeah, that's how Benson had had characterized it. He said that the gospel and the Republican Party are intertwined. They're two heads of the yes. same coin. Yes. And and Benson, it's easy to criticize, of course, Benson's ideas if you don't agree with them. But uh, you know, I, I want to sort of I don't agree with Benson's ideas. I want to be clear on that. It should be obvious. But um but Elder Benson thought that he was saving free enterprise, that he was saving democracy. And to be fair to him, when he was called to go into Eisenhower's cabinet in the fall of 1952, he'd been a member of the Quorum of the Twelve for nine years at that point. He was called into the Quorum in 1943. He had done some extraordinary things in Europe, trying to help the European Latter-day Saints recover from the ravages of World War II. He saw just abject poverty. He saw all kinds of suffering. And so anyway, uh, by 1952, he had emerged as one of the nation's leading farmers. He was in farm cooperatives and farm management. And so um, Benson's cousin uh, had called Eisenhower and also a, um, a Utah uh, senator named Arthur Watkins. So uh, a senator, Utah, um, what is the guy's name? I'm losing his name for mo at the moment. But Benson's cousin, um, who was a senator from um, Ohio, and then Senator Watkins from Utah, they both recommended his name to Eisenhower. And Eisenhower had no idea who Benson was. And so anyway, 1952, Eisenhower invites Benson into the cabinet as a secretary of agriculture. And of course, Benson had to get permission from President McKay because he had to take a leave of absence from his um, ecclesiastical responsibilities. So anyway, um, he goes to the nation's capital and before he embarks for DC, David O. McKay and Reuben Clark, who was the first presidency at the time, they both gave him a blessing. And in the blessing, they told Benson that he was to guard against elements that might harm the constitution. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's important to know what's going on in 1952 and three in this country. Um, Anti-communism has run amok. Alger Hiss, had uh, just been arrested only months earlier for selling uh, secrets to the Soviets. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed a couple of years earlier for selling secrets. So there's a lot of this intrigue going on that people in Washington were communists. And Alger Hiss, I might add, was a member of the, the agricultural department in the 1930s, the guy that was later accused of being a communist. And so Benson thought that he was going into a, a government bureaucracy that was rife with communist infiltration. And so when President McKay and Reuben Clark gave him this blessing, he took this as my charge. I've got to root out communists in the government. And I also have to root out liberalism and uh, socialism, which leads to communism. And so this is this is really what he thinks. This is his calling. And later on, when he becomes really, really extreme, some of his brethren in the 12 try to rein him in. And he's really upset by this because in the 1970s, so David O would have been dead by then. But the 1970s is when Harold Lee and Spencer Kimball tried to rein him in his political views that he, he Benson has a hard time making sense of it because of that blessing that he had been given by David O. McKay and Reuben Clark. And he frequently would tell them this, you are interfering with my apostolic charge to fight against government, big government and communism and liberalism. But from the brethren's point of view, or the people that opposed him, including even conservatives who opposed him, um, they thought that, you know, when he, when Benson would say stuff like, you can't be a good Democrat and a good Latter-day Saint, this is harming the church, right? Because you don't want to create this impression that you have to be a Republican in order to be a good Mormon. And so Spencer Kimball in particular told um, Elder Benson, you can't say that. Don't say that. And don't criticize socialism. You know, every socialist is a communist, too. Because, yeah. they're, they're, I mean, Benson would always say that socialism is communism, which is profound ignorance because they are completely two separate things. And Hugh Brown used to say that, you know, Ezra, you don't understand these two isms. <laughs> anyway, um, so, but Benson, so let's fast, let's rewind just for a moment. So Benson is a principled person. He is a small government person. He is a free market person. The fewer government regulations, the better he would argue. And he goes to Washington completely unprepared for what awaits him. He knows that there's anti-communism going on for sure. 
But he doesn't realize that in order to pass laws and make public policy, you have to compromise. And Benson is a, he's stubborn. He grew up in a church where, as a Mormon apostle, people show great deference to him. But in Washington, he was just another person, and they did not show great deference to him, and he struggled with that. And one of um, one of Benson's friends wrote Reuben Clark, who was a mentor to Benson. So Reuben Clark's also very conservative. One of Benson's friends wrote Reuben Clark, and he said, uh, Dear President Clark, Ezra is in over his head. They're going to eat him and spit him out. He will not last one full term there. And what this friend meant was that he doesn't understand the art of politicking. You have to compromise. So anyway, Reuben Clark writes in this letter, and Reuben Clark himself had been in, before he was called into the first presidency in 1933, Reuben Clark had been associated with three different presidential administrations as a diplomat, as an ambassador. So Reuben Clark understood politics. And Reuben calls in Benson when Benson went back for general conference um, during his government service. Benson would usually go back to Salt Lake in April and uh, October. Anyway, uh, during one of his excursions back to Salt Lake, Reuben Clark called Benson in and he said, look, you've got to compromise. You're not going to last. You won't make it. And Benson's own people around him recognized that he was so inflexible. In fact, one of his aides said something kind of funny. He said that he said that Secretary Benson only follows two Smiths, Adam Smith and Joseph Smith. And oh, that's what you want to hear about your politician, right? That's what you want to hear. Well, you know, Adam Smith is this, this 18th century Scottish thinker that are laissez faire. Don't the government should not get right, involved. Right? right. And then, of course, Joseph Smith was, you know, but anyway, um, so so he finishes his cabinet service. It's very controversial. He's cutting farm subsidies. And when you're a farmer and you rely on these subsidies for your domestic economy, you don't want a government person saying, we're going to cut these. And farmers, just like then and, and today, they rely on subsidies because the government um, subsidizes farmers as a bulwark against just, you know, the the weather, the a bad market, right? We need food. food. The last thing they want is high food prices. Yeah, High food prices or no food at all because of a drought or a famine, right? So the government has to invest in farming. And and so anyway, um, Ezra Duff Benson is taking his cues from Eisenhower to cut farm subsidies. And that's what he does. Most people don't know this. They just blame it on Benson. But in truth, it's Eisenhower telling Benson what to do. Anyway, so Benson's extremely controversial because he's cutting farm subsidies and he would announce these cuts at certain gatherings of farmers and they would throw things at him. I mean, they would throw eggs at him, their shoes at them. I mean, this is a proud of Mormon apostle having things thrown at him. This has never happened before. And anyway, um, Time and Life magazine run critical articles on Benson and the apostles back home are freaking out because one of their own is just absolutely getting vilified in the public. And as part of their blessing that um, Clark and McKay gave them, they also said that you'll be a great example and ambassador for the church. And, you know, what kind of an ambassador can you be when you're having shoes and eggs thrown at you, right? And I so, bet some missionaries suffer that. So maybe it is kind of right in line. with. <laughs> I mean, you know, in terms of the image, it's not going well, right? No, no, no. no. Here's, a, here's a proud apostle just at the butt of everyone's jokes and really getting skewered in the press. And it's I, I can't emphasize enough that this is Time and Life magazine. This is as big as it gets in the 50s. And they're running these critical stories on, Elder, on Secretary Benson. So anyway... Um, all of these politicians, including Republicans, they tell Eisenhower, you got to drop him for the second election. When you run again in 1956, you got to drop Benson. He is dragging you down. And even David O. McKay recognizes this is not a good look for the church. So he flies out to D.C. and he tells President Eisenhower uh, in private, Benson has no idea that this is going on. He says to President Eisenhower, you can you can release him. It's OK. Let him go. We'll, we'll gladly take him back. And Eisenhower, to his credit, says, no, I'm going to keep him. I want him. I can use him. And so Eisenhower ignores David O. McKay, ignores all of these angry Republicans and Democrats who want Benson out of the scene, and he keeps him for a second term. And how does Benson repay him? When he leaves government service in 1961, he joins the John Burt Society or affiliates with them. 
And he buys into this stuff of the politician that we talked about a minute ago, where Eisenhower is a communist. And of course, this gets back to Eisenhower that, <laughs> that his former secretary is calling him a communist. And Ike, of course, is just beside himself. And he writes these nasty letters to Eisen or to Benson. How could you do this about me? I stood by you for eight years. You were controversial. I was loyal to you. And now you're calling me a communist. How could you do it? And so Benson turns on his boss and... Anyway, it's not a good it's not a good look. He, Benson becomes radicalized. And I've been asked this before, and it, it's worth just pausing for a moment. How could Benson do this? And well, yeah, he's reading the Burt Society stuff. But why would he believe this stuff? You know, damn well, he's not a communist, right? You serve with him. This is a five star general. And it wasn't just that Ike was being called a communist. It was Ike's brother, Milton Eisenhower, who was a close associate with Ike. And also the Secretary of State, a guy named John Foster Dulles, that Benson had very warm relations with. So he's calling several people a communist, Benson is, along with the Birchers. Anyway, the, the upshot is, is that um, Benson was upset that Eisenhower never came to his defense when he had those eggs hurled at him. And, you know, that's that's something that you do as a cabinet officer. You you take the blame, right? That's just just, it's anticipated that you'll do that. But Benson thought that the Eisenhower should have at least made an overture in his direction by telling people, hey, look, don't get mad at Ezra. He's just doing what I wanted him to do. And so it's personal that Ike left this proud man out to dry. And he was absolutely mortified by all of this. And Benson wasn't sleeping well. He wasn't when this was going on. I mean, he wasn't sleeping well. He wrote one of his friends back in um, I, or Salt Lake and he said, please put me on the temple prayer roll. I'm not doing well. And yeah, I found this incredible li uh, letter in Eisenhower's presidential library. Some of Benson's papers are there, including that letter where he writes his friend in Salt Lake saying, put me on the temple prayer roll. So anyway, um, so Benson becomes affiliated with the Birch Society. He wanted to join, but David O. McKay wouldn't let him. And it's an extremely anti radical anti-communist organization. When I say radical, I want to explain what I mean for your listeners, because um, I get asked all the time, you know, what's the difference between conservative and radical? Conservative is your sort of mainstream, right? As a conservative Republican, you might oppose civil rights because you, you think that civil rights ought to be governed at the state level rather than the federal level, right? Um, conservative would mean that you believe in free markets. You don't want government intrusion, you know, those those sorts of things. A radical is somebody who thinks that the five-star general is a communist. A radical is someone who thinks that Martin Luther King is a communist agent. And so those are all above and beyond mainstream conservatism. And so a lot of mainstream conservatives, including probably the most iconic um, conservative figure in the 1960s, a guy named Barry Goldwater from Arizona, who was the presidential candidate in 1964, He's he's the quintessential conservative. He does not think Dr. King is a communist. He does not think General Eisenhower is a communist, but he's definitely a conservative. And so um, Benson and Skousen and some folks like that are definitely on the fringes of the Republican Party. That makes them extreme. And and people will use those terms. They'll call, you know, Benson and those folks extreme. Hugh Brown uses that word a lot. He calls Skousen and Benson the extremists of the church. And so I think it's important to make those distinctions because a lot of the general authorities are definitely conservatives. They're theological conservatives, they're political conservatives, but they're not conspiracy mongrels. They don't believe that King is a communist. They don't believe that Ike is a commie. Um, there's probably maybe one or two people in upper church leadership who believe in the Birch claims other than Benson, but most of them do not believe this stuff and they think it's harming the church. And so Benson um, gets involved with this radical group He's also listening to right-wing talk radio, and which is really coming of age in the 1950s. It's kind of extraordinary to think that, right? Because we we listen to, or we hear about right-wing talk radio today, or right-wing talk podcasts, or, but it comes of age in the early 50s during the Cold War. And there's a couple of people, guy, one guy named Dan Smoot. There's, um, there's a guy named Billy Jean Hargis. These are like the famous right-wing talk. They're the Rush Limbaugh's of the day. 
And Benson is clued right into it. He loves these people. He listens to them frequently. He invites them to speak to people in Salt Lake at the Tabernacle. He quotes them in his books and his sermons. And so he's really being radicalized by right-wing talk radio. And he's going around to the church in general conference, BYU devotionals, anywhere who asks him to speak. And he politicizes just about every address he gives. I mean, it's really, just to think about this for a moment, it's extraordinary when you have an apostle being asked to speak and you expect it to be something spiritual, right? Maybe even Christ-centered. And what you're hearing is that Eisenhower is a communist, that the other presidents who come after him are communists. The United Nations is a communist plot. Fluoridated water that we take for granted today, right? We 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 put fluoridate uh, fluoridation in the water to protect our teeth. That was a secret plot to subvert yeah. public health. Yeah. I mean, this was all unhinged. But this is the stuff that that Benson and Skousen are peddling. And since we're talking about um, Christian nationalism today, they're also touting a Christian nationalist view that with anti-communism run amok with uh, the Cold War and the Russians and with the Vietnam War in the 60s, with the civil rights movement and the women's movement, Benson and Skousen think the country is coming unhinged, just literally unhinged. It's falling apart at the seams. And the way to bring it all back together is to emphasize Christ, to emphasize Christian teachings, and to emphasize that this is a Christian nation run by Christian founders, the Constitution is scripture, and that the only way to, to reestablish the United States as a sort of leading global power is to uh, reaffirm your Christian values. And so this is, I mean, hardly unique to Benson and Skousen, right? But this is what they're teaching. And if you look at their sermons, they're they're teaching Christian nationalism all over the place. And in fact, I have a talk here that um, since I'm working in this area as we speak, there's a, it's around here. Oh, right here. It's called The Christ and the Constitution. And it's published in 1964 in the, uh, what's called the American Opinion. It's a Burt Society periodical. And this is about as Christian nationalism as you can get, that every every part of the Constitution has Jesus Christ's fingerprints on it. And then later, Benson, three years later, I think he recognizes it's a controversial statement to think that Jesus was, you know, front and center of every clause of the Constitution. So he gives the same or a similar address in conference three years later, but changes the title. What does it and say? This Sorry. one's called Prepare Then Fear Not. Ah, wow. so it's the same address, right? But it, it's purpose. But it's it's yeah, it's the same address. And you know, I'll put my 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 scholarly hat on for a moment. Is that when you look at the Constitution? I teach the Constitution. I teach legal history is in at my university, and I have my students read James Madison's notes. He's the founding father that kept a detailed, meticulous record of the the three month debates when they wrote the Constitution. And I always tell my students, I said, you know, you can tell what's on their minds, what they're thinking about, who's influencing them when you read these debates and notes. They're not quoting the Bible. They're not quoting Jesus. They're not quoting, you know. And so it's really, really remiss to argue that, you know, Jesus was front and center of all of this stuff because that's not what they're doing. I'm not trying to say they're not religious because that's not true. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But to argue that that Jesus was behind every clause in the Constitution, it's just not supported by any factual evidence. And so certainly they're talking about European philosophers. They're talking about the Roman republics they had studied. But they're not looking to the Bible and the Ten Commandments and you know the stuff that we often hear from Christian nationalists. So anyway, they're quoting, they're promoting this Christian nationalism theme in the 1960s as a way to overcome all of the ills that plague American society. And one of the things that they're doing is they're calling on the most popular, yeah, arguably one of the most popular government officials in the 1950s and 60s, a guy named J. Edgar Hoover, who was the FBI director. And Hoover is a really a fascinating character, extremely controversial, came to power in 1922. He left the bureau, the FBI as its director, well, when he died, I guess, in 1972. So he served for over five decades, the longest FBI director we've ever had. And Hoover believes in this Christian nationalism stuff big time. 
In fact, he argues that white people are supposed to lead the charge. So it's white Christian nationalism. 99% of the, the FBI under Hoover's direction was white, 99%. And his top lieutenants frequently commented how he didn't like black people and people of color, didn't like Jews, didn't like liberals. So one can immediately see why Benson and Skousen would take to the, to Hoover <laughs> because they follow that they're, they're like Hoover. They're segregationists. Right. They, they don't think that black and white people ought to integrate. They shouldn't have relationships. They both, they also, they all oppose civil rights. So anyway, they find a kinship in Hoover and, Benson and Skousen. Skousen was in the FBI from 1935 to 1951. So he was there for 16 years. So he knew Hoover personally. And Benson knew Hoover when he uh, went into Eisenhower's cabinet. So as a cabinet member, he got to know the FBI director. And so they recognized that Hoover was promoting this white Christian nationalism. And so in 1955, after four years after who, uh, Skousen left the bureau, he went to work for BYU. And he wrote a letter to the director and he said, hey, we would love to have you talk about your Christian themes at BYU. Now, Christian themes, that's white, that's white nationalism. We would love to have you. Our students need to hear your message. And Hoover turns him down. He said, you know, I'm about ready to retire. And so I'm flattered, but thank you. And as a gesture to that invitation, Hoover sends... David O. McKay, who supported the gesture, a copy, an autographed copy of, of Hoover's book called Masters of Deceit, in which he articulates this white Christian nationalism message. Anyway, um, in the late 50s and early 60s, Benson tries to get Hoover to come to Utah. And he tries to get him to come to BYU. He asks him to speak in general conference. I mean, one can imagine what? that that Dieter Uchtdorf or anybody else in the 12 today would call up, you know, James Comey or Christopher Ray, you know, the current yeah. FBI guy. Hey, can you yeah. come speak at our conference? This will be great. I mean, but this is just where we're at in the, yeah. in the 50, late 50s and 60s. So come speak at our conference. And Hoover turns him down and Benson then writes him a, a letter. Can we publish all of your sermons in, in our in our press, our desert book press? Can we publish them? And Hoover turns him down, but he said, you can publish a couple of my talks, but but not all of them. And so in 1966 and again in 68, the improvement era, which is the precursor to the enzyme, they published two of Hoover's talks that address white Christian nationalism. And Benson also um, writes this very detailed priesthood manual that he wants the priesthood brethren of the church to study. And it's 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 Hoover's books. He wants the priesthood brother just, just to study Hoover's books. And he sends a copy to Hugh Nibley, the great um, BYU scholar slash apologist, and trying to get Nibley's support for this. And Nibley's like, this is just crazy. It's stupid. And so Nibley's not on board with this nonsense. Go Nibley. <laughs> and um, the, the brethren, um, most of them are not on board either because they recognize that if you're going to bash the bash communism and bash socialism and just promote Christianity, you're going to be put offish to people in Northern Europe that they're trying to attract. And David O. McKay is trying to globalize the church. You're not going to be able to get in behind the Iron Curtain if you're bashing communism and socialism. So they turn it down. Benson's upset that his priesthood manual studying uh, Hoover doesn't get passed. Anyway, um, by 1971, um, I, I won't go into details unless you have follow-up questions, but Hoover runs this, this um, illegal wiretap on civil rights groups. It's called COINTELPRO. It's a counterintelligence FBI program. It's a secret, top secret program. He's basically spying on Malcolm X, Black Panthers, uh, Martin Luther King. He's doing it all illegally. And Hoover gets exposed. And without going into details, he gets exposed. And so Hoover is now public enemy number one for people who care about the Constitution, you know, our Fourth Amendment privacy rights that Hoover, the nation's top law enforcement officer, has so blatantly ignored. So he gets exposed. And who comes to his defense? Skousen and Benson. And the, the same people who, you know, the Constitution's hanging by a thread. Well, anyway, they, got, they come to his defense and they go on this letter writing campaign to Richard Nixon, who's now the president, 
and they write a bunch of other people saying that this is the greatest guy, greatest government servant we've ever had. And his message of, of, of Christianity needs to be heard. They don't even, even care to talk about what he did that got him, you know, shamed. But anyway, so they come to his defense and they write letters. They, they give talks at BYU. Benson's talking about how Hoover was misunderstood in general conference. Even in 1986, when Benson was the president, he's still giving public declarations of support for Hoover, who's now been dead for well over a decade. But yeah, I think the, uh, the upshot of this story that I'm sharing with you is that Hoover did not teach white Christian nationalism to, to Benson and Skousen. This stuff was baked into the church's theology ever since 1830. What they what Hoover did do, though, was allow Benson and Skousen, a high profile uh, person to help them disseminate that message. And so they used Hoover in that re that regard. And Hoover only allowed himself to be used a little bit because just about everything they invited him to do in Utah, he turned them down, save for those two articles he allowed to be published. And the answer is, or the reason is, um, it became clear in, in 2010 why Hoover turned them down when, when Ezra Taft Benson and Cleon Skousen's FBI files became available, which I have. And um, in the early 60s, as I mentioned, Benson and Skousen became affiliated with the Burt Society, and Hoover wanted nothing to do with the Burt Society. In fact, Hoover had said something really revealing when he was asked during a congressional uh, committee testimony, if he thought that Eisenhower was a communist, Hoover said, quote, anybody who thinks that General Eisenhower is a communist has something seriously wrong with them. And so in these secret FBI files on Benson and Skousen, um, Hoover and his underlings, his lieutenants, they make it very clear in inter-office memos that we want nothing to do with Skousen and Benson. They used to have a warm relationship in the 50s, but by the 1960s, when, when Benson and Skousen became affiliated with, with the Birchers, that's when um, Hoover kept them at a distance. And if they didn't align with the Burt Society, Hoover probably would have spoken at BYU, probably would have spoken at the LDS General Conference, but their memos make it very clear, we cannot be aligned with these people because of they're in too far with the Birchers. So anyway, that's how they they used him um, to protect the Constitution is he was such a powerful figure and he was so revered up until the COINTEL story broke in the late 60s. I mean, Americans loved this guy. They had no idea he was breaking the law, but they loved him. And so they went along with it. And Benson and Skousen recognized that his popularity could help them in Mormon communities. Was there any concern? I mean, everyone in the church and the apostles knew that Benson would be the prophet. I mean, there's no mechanism to remove someone like this, right? Were they concerned at all that this incredibly radical person would have, was, you know, just inching closer and closer to the top seat of Mormonism? Oh, oh yeah. Heck yeah. So David L. McKay, when, when Benson would give his speeches in public or his sermons to the saints, the saints, a number of saints, they would write into the office of the first presidency and they would say, you know, Elder Benson gave us uh, spoke to our state conference, you know, last weekend. And I am so disappointed. I, I wanted to hear about Christ and his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Instead, I heard about how everyone in the government's a communist. <laughs> and I, I'm so disillusioned by all of this. Yeah. And so, of course, you know, as a church, you're off the, the tracks when you're getting protest letters all over the place. Right. And I want to be clear on something. In the 50s and 60s, most Mormons in the, in the United States probably supported Benson and Skousen. Mm -hmm. No question. But there was a strong vocal minority who were writing those protest letters to the office of the first presidency. And I don't want to pretend to tell you they're all, you know, liberal Democrat. That's not true. These are these are moderate Republicans who don't share these conspiracy views. And so anyway, the first presidency, what they do, Hugh Brown and a guy named Henry Moyle, the other counselor, they tell President McKay, look, we've got to do something about this. This the, the Birchers are just crazy. We can't have a senior apostle affiliating with them. So David O calls in uh, Elder Benson and he says, look, you can't you can't associate with the Birch Society. Don't go to their meetings. You, you just can't be on their board of directors. And Benson's response is, well, can I still talk about communism, though? 
And President McKay said, you, you may, but just don't mention the Bergers. Well, I'm going to critique President McKay for a moment here. Um, he's he's in his late 80s. He's got moments of senility. Yeah. And he didn't understand that by allowing Elder Benson to continue to talk about communism, that the, the saints would not make a distinction between communism and birchism. You don't have to use the word birch for the saints to recognize that whenever they heard an anti-communist sermon, they were getting the birch line. So Benson pledged to abide by that. He said, OK, I won't mention birchers anymore in public, but he still talked about communism and it was all the birch ideas. And so some of the brethren were upset because they thought President McKay was protecting Benson. And, and he was. And when David O. McKay died in January of 1970, Benson was exposed because he had been told by Harold Lee in particular, who was the most senior apostle other than Joseph Fielding Smith. And Joseph Fielding Smith was 93 years of age when David O. died in January of 1970. And Joseph Fielding was sleeping through most of his church meetings at this point. I mean, cognitively, he wasn't doing well. I, I have lots of accounts in my research files of people, apostles going to meetings, and there's Joseph Fielding sleeping. He's just snoring in a meeting. And here's the new church president. So that effect so, on all of us, it seems. <laughs> yeah, that effect. Well, and you should be napping when you're 93. Right. I'm sorry. You should be able to take a nap. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. You should be at home retired going You fishing. should be in a lounge chair doing a crossword but, puzzle. This is ridiculous. So anyway, they didn't think that he would be the president very long because of his age and his health. And so Harold Lee was the guy they were looking to. Yeah. He was in his early 70s. Yep. And they thought, it turns out he wasn't the president very long, as we all probably know. He was in the hot seat for a year and a half. He died unexpectedly after a year and a half as the church president. But anyway, um, Harold Lee told Benson, he said, look, now that President McKay's um, gone, you're done. Your politics are over. You're done. And Harold Lee was a very abrasive man. He had a big temper. He was not afraid to let people know his temper. And he knew... Um, Ezra Taft Benson really well because they grew up in adjacent communities in Idaho. And so they played church basketball together. So Harold Lee and Ezra knew each other really well. And so Harold Lee had come into the quorum just two years earlier than Benson. So he had him in seniority by two years. And so Harold Lee told Benson, you're done. You're not going to talk about Gadiant and robbers, about secret combinations, none of this nonsense anymore. You're done. And so Benson, of course, was upset because he thought this was his apostolic calling. And he's really upset that he's being reined in. So anyway, uh, so Joseph Healing Smith dies. Harold Lee is the president. He dies after a year and a half. Now it's Spencer Kimball, this, you know, five foot six inch, 170 pound little guy that Benson thinks he can run all over. And the uh, what's interesting about uh, Kimball is they were called into the quorum at the same time, but they made Kimball the senior leader because of, of his age. He was just a little bit older than Benson. So anyway, um, uh, Benson thinks that he can resume his his political influence with President Kimball. You know, this little guy, I can walk all over him and he doesn't have the backbone and the temper of Harold Lee. And boy, Benson was mistaken. And the first general conference address after Lee died, Benson is back at it again, secret combinations and all of this nonsense. And President Kimball calls him in and he said that you can't do this. He rebukes him in private. And, and I should tell you that um, people complained about this sermon. And so, again, when you get complaints, you have to do something. So he calls him in and... And he said, you're the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. You're going to be the church president when I'm gone. You have to bring all people to the church, not just these conservative types. And Kimball did not like the Burt Society. He thought they were harming the church. And so politically, these two guys were worlds apart. Anyway, um, Benson, being the headstrong guy that he was, did not listen to Kimball. He gave a talk at BYU in, in February of 1980, and this is a devotional talk, and you, I'm sure you guys have heard it. It's called 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet. It's it's well known in church seminary manuals and all of this stuff. Well, that's one of the most controversial talks he'd ever given for a couple of reasons, is that of those 14 points that he talked about in following the prophet, 
One of them was that the living prophet is more important than a dead prophet. This is a complete insult to all of, you know, Kimball's predecessors. And the other one was that Benson said that a prophet could speak for the church and God in political matters. And that sent off alarm bells to a lot of people in the church because they were afraid that he was going to endorse Ronald Reagan's presidency and align the LDS church with the Republican Party. Evangelicals had already aligned themselves with with Reagan and the Republican Party, and Benson wanted to follow a similar path. Anyway, so Kimball calls in Benson and absolutely rebukes him to high heaven. And he said that you need to apologize to the Quorum of the Twelve next week. We've had so many complaints about that talk from you. You need to come to apologize to your fellow brethren of the Twelve. So Benson, um, Kimball forces him to apologize. And Kimball didn't think it was sincere enough. So he said, you're going to come back the next week and you're going to apologize to all the general authorities, the 70s, all of them, the presiding bishopric. And so Benson's like, you know, President Kimball's reining him in. Anyway, so he makes him apologize again the following week. And somebody from public relations in the church wrote an official apology they were going to release to the public. I know it's not Benson's own writing. And they never released it, but they had it ready to go because this is a really controversial talk. So I'll, I'll end this story here that that's the last time in public where Benson really gives this controversial address. And when he became the church president in November of 1985, people thought that that he left his politics behind and all of it. He's no longer worried about right wing politics. They were really worried about him. But the truth is, that's not that's not accurate at all. Benson was 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 still really, really political. He's still quoting J. Edgar Hoover. The, pro- the difference is he no longer quotes the, the Birchers when he's the president because he's been reined in by Kimball, by Harold Lee, and now Gordon Hinckley. And so what President Benson does when he's the president is that he has surrogates who advance this extremist white nationalist message for him. And so he calls in a couple of general authorities, and their job is to advance this Birch stuff because he feels like he can't do it because Gordon Hinckley, Tom Monson... And weirdly enough, even Boyd Packer, they all gang up on Benson and tell him to cut it off, knock it off. So there's a long history of of um, getting, you know, pushing back on Elder Benson and not wanting him to give sermons that would be divisive to the church body, especially as the church is trying to modernize and move away from this idea that it's a right wing church. President Hinckley, among all of the leaders, in my opinion, is probably the most effective in in trying to rebrand the church in the 1980s and 90s. They just don't want it to be associated with the Birch Society. But yet, Benson, that's where he's trying to take the church. Do, do you think Benson teaching flood the world with the Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, was that a way to, you know, promote the secret combinations and all of that instead yeah, yeah, of teaching numbers. that you can say flood the world with you know read the book of mormon and you'll find out all about the secret combinations do you think that played <laughs> into or- well it's funny is you know i'm not going to hold back you know my i guess my bias on these sorts of things but when you read a text you always read with your own biases in mind right i mean if the three of us are reading any text right now Maybe, Rebecca, you might read it differently because you're a woman, right? I might read it differently because in, in land because we're men or we, we might even have a regional bias, you know, uh, depending on where we live. And so in the early 70s, Benson talked about for the first time, he, he said, everyone needs to read the Book of Mormon. They're going to read anti-evolution. They're going to read anti-Darwin. They're going to read, you know, all this stuff in there. And I'm thinking, not if you don't have those biases already, you're not going to read that. And so Landon, that's exactly what he what he wants to do is to flood the church with the Book of Mormon because people will just see that socialism's right there in Second Nephi mm-hmm. chapter three, you know. But you're not going to read that, what Benson wants you to read, unless you already believe politically like him. And what's interesting is that Benson's the first church president or church authority, I should say to connect secret combinations with socialism and big government and all of that. No one's ever done that before. Now, he's not the first leader to talk about secret combinations in government. I mean, some of the church leaders since the, as early as the 19th century had been doing that. 
but he's the first person to really connect it to politics. And he does that very strategically. And I frankly think it's brilliant because he's taking sacred scripture and he's trying to justify his conspiracist worldview. And, you know, my my father, who's conservative, but he uh, his siblings were birchers and all of this. My dad was never a bircher, but definitely a conservative guy. And I've asked him before, I said, when you read the Book of Mormon, do you read anti-evolution? Do you read anti-liberalism you know, liberalism and all this stuff? And he's like, no. And I said, thank you. Because this is just crazy talk, right? But that's, the people who are predetermined to see this, that's what they see and that's what they read. But it's it's also brilliant. And I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you're playing to your base. Your base sees it. They read it with the bias and they right. go, yeah, Benson's sticking up for what we believe in, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the church is going, oh, I love the Book of Mormon. I love the and, Book of Mormon. Yeah. And, yeah. As a missionary during that time frame, it was Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon. We yeah. all came to this. And, and I think a lot of this, when you see missionaries out today and they're all, this is the Book of Mormon. It's I think a lot of that came from Benson because it yeah. that was the point that the Book of Mormon really was, you know, almost like it, this is as important as Jesus, the Book of Mormon, you know? Well, it is. And, and missionaries in particular, I mean, when I was on my mission, um, we, we emphasized the Book of Mormon because of its message of Christ, right? Not about politics. You know, read this. You'll hate Charles Darwin in evolution. I mean, you know, that's just nonsense. <laughs> But that's how Benson read it. That's how Skousen read it. And that's how their followers read it. But I think most people in the church, I dare say, they probably read it for which it's intended, right? It's supposed to be another testament of Jesus Christ. And it's got some great, you know, moral lessons in there about Jesus, about how to treat people. And I don't think most, I could be wrong. I guess we all can disagree on these kinds of things. But I think most people are reading the book for that message rather than the political overtones that Benson ascribed to it. Right. I, I also think that some of those political overtones are so baked in. Like you said, if you're looking for it, you find it. I have a family member who in his ward was introduced to the idea of kingsmen and free men, you know, using all this rhetoric in the Book of Mormon, eventually stopped paying his taxes, eventually went to jail, you know, but it was all this Book of Mormon, religion, kingsmen, freemen. I think of the title of liberty and how that is used. Oh my goodness. We probably don't even need to go into that, but it's there if you're looking for it. It's absolute justification for a lot of these things that are happening now. Did Elder Benson call anybody um, as the church president who, who had influence politically like that? Any, anybody that he called, like as far as apostles or general authorities that are now rising through the ranks that are continuing this kind of rhetoric? Well, so yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, he had been reined in by other leaders and the media and other people who watched his presidency thought that he had sort of curbed his politics. Mm -hmm. Not not even close. I have his letters to the Birch people. You know, he's in fact, the first thing that Benson did when he was ordained the 13th church president was he wrote the Birch people and he said, can you send your literature to my two counselors, Gordon Hinckley, Tom Monson, and my secretary, Arthur Haycock? <laughs> and <laughs> so he, he uh, bill me, I'll pay for it. And then about, I don't know, a month or two later, the a Birch person wrote President Benson and said, I'm not, I'm not going to bill you anymore. You don't need to send him. We're not sending any more uh, our stuff to Monson, Hinckley, Haycock, because they said they don't want it. And so this is what he's doing. And he also invites the Birch president to Salt Lake City when he's there as the president. And I interviewed this guy. He's still alive. So he knew Ezra Taft Benson personally. But anyway, um, so yes, Benson is trying to call people who associate with the Birch Society and also white Christian nationalism into the church leadership. Mm -hmm. And the first person he wants to call is his son, Reed Benson. And Reed Benson is, um, he is a bircher. He's like his father. He's been radicalized. And without going into the details that, um, let's just say that the Quorum of the Twelve pushed back hard. They do not, one of the, I'll just, I'll, I'll let a little teaser I don't know if I can show this publicly, but one of the quorum of the 12 members threatens to resign if Reed Benson is the new apostle. That's how strong this person feels. And so 
obviously that would create a public relations catastrophe if one of the 12 resigns. So anyway, if that's the card you're using and you play, then President Benson's been checkmated. I mean, he can't do it. So his son is off the table. He wants to call Cleon Skousen into church leadership, but he knows that Skousen is, is like, there's no way. He had been trying to get um, Skousen called into the general authority ranks from at least since the 1960s. But a lot of the general authorities did not like Skousen. They didn't like his writings. So, and of course, he's this fringy political figure they didn't like. So anyway, he was off limits. And so uh, Benson's first call as a general authority was a guy named H. Verlin Anderson, who taught accounting at BYU. And Verlin Anderson and Benson were longtime buddies. They were both birchers. And Verlin Anderson used to write a number of Benson's um, sermons. And the title of Liberty, Kingman, Freeman, that was that was all there. And so he calls Verlin Anderson. And when Anderson got the call to go to Salt Lake to, to meet with church leaders, he thought he was going to get a call for the Quorum of the Twelve. And <laughs> he goes there and Gordon Hinckley meets with them. And of course, Hinckley is the first counselor. And he tells Verlin Anderson, he said, you've been called to the second quorum of the 70 for a term of three years. <laughs> nah, <laughs> and, nah, ben nah, nah. <laughs> and Benson had been telling him, you know, that, you know, when I'm the president, I'm going to make you an apostle. Right. He'd been telling Verlin Anderson this. Oh. And so it was a complete shock that it's only three years, it's the second quorum. And President Hinckley tells Verlin Anderson, he says, I want to be clear on something. We didn't want you here. And when he said that, what he meant by, we don't want what you stand for, your politics. And Berlin Anderson's written books of his own about Gadiant and robbers and white Christian nationalism. So Gordon Hinckley puts the kibosh on the call to the 12, but the, the, the compromise is we'll get him into the second quorum of the 70 in three years, he's out. So Hinckley tells Berlin Anderson, he said that when during your ministry, you are not to mention any politics, anti-government themes, Gadiant and robbers, secret combinations, title of liberty, none of that stuff. And so three years later, when he has his exit interview with President Hinckley, Hinckley says the same instruction still applies. Even as emeritus, you were not to do this stuff to Latter-day Saints. And they also, because Verlin Anderson had such a following with the books he had written with these anti-government tropes, um, somebody from church headquarters under Hinckley's direction, they called Desert Book. And they said, take all of his books out of print. And if anybody calls and asks for them, just say they're out of print. I mean, so this is the church trying to really, again, modernize and get away from the clutches of right-wing extremism. And so um, you asked today about, are there people in leadership today with these kinds of things? And um, they learned their lesson from Benson that they would, I think I, I'm going to speculate here for a moment. Some of your listeners or other people may not agree with me, but... But they learned their lesson from Benson that they don't want anyone as controversial in church leadership again. I mean, Benson was extremely controversial because he was always promoting these conspiracy theories to the saints and the saints would always complain or frequently complain. So you wouldn't get anyone as, as, as um, intensely partisan as Benson in the church leadership today. But you do get very conservative general authorities, you know, men who are in their 80s, they're not inclined to change in their 90s. And you look at someone like Russell Ballard, who was aligned to some extent with Tim Ballard. There was a friendship there, we're told, and there's lots of allegations, of course. But Russell Ballard would probably reject the idea that he's a white Christian nationalist. He's not reading this literature. He's not identifying as such. But if you ask him simple questions like, Elder Ballard, do you believe that this was a Christian nation and founded as a Christian nation? He would say yes. Mm -hmm. You believe that the founding fathers were Christian men. He would say, yes. Do you think that this country will flourish if we return to the principles of Christianity? He would say yes, mm -hmm. right? But he would probably reject the label of white Christian nationalism. So he's he's abiding by all the tenets of it without really aligning with it. And then when someone like Tim Ballard comes along and, and peddles his wares, you know, hawking, grifting, really, um, and trying to raise money with his... Um, OUR uh, organization, it seems like a noble cause. 
mm -hmm. right? You know, you're saving the children. So you can see him manipulating something like Russell Ballard, who's what, 90 years of age. Mm -hmm. And, you know, come do this for the children. So Ballard's going to donate and help the cause without realizing it's a complete sham, right? You're grifting off of people. And I, I always I want to share something with your, your listeners about how to recognize shams like this. And one of the ways that you can recognize shams is when people will throw out, like Tim Ballard and others, they'll throw things out like, you know, the government's doing it. What? Right. They don't give names. They don't give details. It's just people in government are peddling children or Democrats are peddling children. Right. Or and um, or the other one would be a Hollywood. Right. They're doing it in Hollywood. And you have to stop and ask, you know, who are these people doing this and why would they do this? What is the motive for somebody in Hollywood? And um, there was a woman that was cutting my hair a couple of months ago and she brought up Tim Ballard's movie that I have not seen, but I've certainly heard about. And she said, have you seen it? And I said, no. And I'm thinking to myself, and I have no intention to. <laughs> but um, anyway, have you seen it? And I said, no. And I said, well, tell me about it. What did you think? Oh, I can't believe what they're doing in government and what Hollywood's doing. And I said, well, who, who is it? And does the film talk about who in government? No, no, no. But they're just doing it. I said, but, but it doesn't mention any names. No. Well, who in Hollywood? Well, it's just Hollywood, she says. And I said, well, why, why would someone do it in Hollywood? And she said, um, why would they peddle children? Uh, because the money. And I asked her a question. And I'm being very careful, right? She's got scissors. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I said, um, I said, why, why would Hollywood people risk going to jail? They're already millionaires. They don't need this money. Why would they risk that? And you can just hear this pause. And she she just stopped cutting for just a quick second. And I thought, change the subject, change the subject. <laughs> but anyway, when, when you just throw out there, they're all doing it. And there's no mm -hmm. detail. There's no nuance. I mean, there, there's your first clue, you know, right there. And it's, um, but most people don't have those critical skills to sort of see through that, that trope. But it's also part of a QAnon conspiracy thing that's been going on for a long time, right? Yeah. But the QAnon people had accused Hillary Clinton of running a, a, a a child sex trafficking mm -hmm. organization from this pizzeria in Virginia. Yeah. Why would Hillary Clinton do that? You may hate her politics. You may hate her personally, but she is too smart to risk going to jail for the rest of her life. I mean, it just makes no sense, but yet so many people, you know, latch onto these crazy ideas. So yeah. what do you think? Um, you know, one of the concerning things to me, as, as I said earlier in the show was, when this all came down, all of a sudden you've got men like Glenn Beck, Mike Lee, Sean Reyes, all men who are very closely tied to the church. In fact, he picked up the phone and called an apostle immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, if if they're not part of them, then they're certainly not being pushed away uh, mm -hmm. by these men. So how do how does that? And you know, you I guess you, we can argue. You know, Mike Lee is he a uh, a right wing conservative or is he uh, an extremist? Uh, you know, some people will say one way, some people will say the other. But, you know, what what's the tie in there? It, it just seems Glenn Beck is obviously very extreme right wing. Uh, but the church seems to just pick up the phone and respond and actually answer his questions and respond to him. Whereas me, a centrist, you know, someone who was in the in the church had no access at all to to these yeah. men. Mike Lee, a former classmate of mine at BYU. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You're part of it. You're tied in. Now we know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Frightening. <laughs> Let me say a word about Mike Lee. Mike Lee's father would be rolling over in his grave right now to know what his son has become. Rex Lee was a a very honorable conservative Christian man. And he was the um, solicitor general in the Reagan administration in the early 80s. And he was widely recognized as one of the most effective advocates before the Supreme Court of anyone in United States history. And he was also the president of BYU when I was there and extremely well respected in political circles. And I want to emphasize a conservative Republican. Mike Lee is a radical. And you can always tell somebody by the company they keep, right? He's good friends with another radical 
uh, Ted Cruz from Texas. Mm -hmm. And somebody might say, oh, what evidence do you have that he's a radical? I mean, how much time do you have? <laughs> I'll give you just one. Mike Lee denied that the election was stolen. We have evidence, right? And and then when the some of this stuff started to become public, the emails that he was writing about trying to endorse fake electors and all this stuff, then he backed off of it. That's a radical view. And to thwart the peaceful transition of power. And it's also a radical view when 70 plus courts have ruled against you, and yet you're still peddling this idea the election was stolen. That's a problem because this is a country that's premised on the rule of law. And whether you like you, us, people in general, whether we like the Supreme Court's decisions or not, they have the final say when it comes to how we adjudicate the law in this country. And over 70 courts um, ruled against this fraudulent election idea. And a lot of these um, courts were Republicans, you know. So to suggest that that Lee is a conservative, he started out conservative, but he, he certainly moved in right wing circles. And I should also tell you that Mike Lee was close to Cleon Skousen, too. And Red Skousen stuff was influenced by Skousen. So definitely he's drinking from conspiratorial waters. Um, Lana, your question is about access to church leadership. The leaders of the church always stay close to high profile Latter day Saints who have positions of power. And Glenn Beck has, you know, he's a, obviously a, a public personality. He's always going to have a, a, a phone line to somebody in Salt Lake because people listen to him. Mike Lee, by virtue of his being an active, of him being an active Latter day Saint and being a United States senator, will always have immediate access to church leaders, always. Mitt Romney, I'm reading his biography now that McKay Coppins wrote. Maybe you, you've seen it. Yep. And you you read that book and it, it's, it's, it's clear that Romney always had access to the brethren in Salt Lake. And they wanted to know what he was doing. And, and I, I guess a different question is that how much influence do the general authorities you know, give the politicians? Or, or share with the politicians? And the answer would be, it depends on who the politician is, depends on the general authority. And it depends on the politician giving the brethren space to, to influence them on public policy. And you, you, you see this often. I'm thinking of, let me give you one example. From 1962, Utah had a law that would criminalize interracial marriage. And what was interesting about this law is that the law wasn't just criminalizing black and white people from marrying. It also was criminalizing Asians from marrying Caucasians and all of that. Well, the, the problem with that was is that that a, there was an Asian population in Utah and they were marrying, you know, Caucasian people in violation of the law. And so a lot of these Latter-day Saints are breaking the law because they're Mormon, white Mormon men are marrying Asian women that they had met in Vietnam and elsewhere. And so they wanted to change the law. And of course they were fearful of what it would do if they changed the law, because it would allow black people to marry white people too. And that's of course, during the priesthood days, that was a no-no. So anyway, um, Utah's delegation, a number of the congressmen and senators, they went to the first presidency and they met with him and they said, look, we wanna change this law. We want your blessing though. And so they're asking deliberate a deliberate question. Do you support this? We we use, and they ultimately go along with it. And you do see um, some apostles in later years. Well, they'll 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 call a, a senator or a congressperson that they have a relationship with, and they'll offer unsolicited advice about a bill that they feel strongly about. So it just varies from time to time. But with um, with someone like uh, Mike Lee. You know, I don't know. I, I really I can't I can speculate maybe, but I don't think that he's calling and getting feedback from the brethren about certain public policy positions. Mike Lee is so far to the right with the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus and those folks. He's going to do whatever the the winds blow and tell him to do so. One of the things that that caught me and that uh, I guess bothered me was that you know, Tim Ballard, it seemed like all of these men in this, you know, definitely Sean Reyes, he's the one who promoted him, uh, you know, for a senator and, and kind of broke the news. 
they all seem to have this concept that he was going to be the next senator. He was going to be this <laughs> prophet. He was going the to president of well. the United States. He was the chosen <laughs> and the prophet going to save the nation. <laughs> and where did that come from? That all of these men are thinking mm -hmm. that it, it seems to me it had to have come from a higher authority that has told them. Hey, there were several apostolic blessings that said yeah, that. They mentioned that he had an apostolic blessing, yeah. but of course we don't have a copy of the. No, apostolic. we don't know that it's in there. We have some of the blessings from Tom, Tom Harris, Harris, where he specifically. Now he's not a church leader uh, per se, but there seems to be this underlying message that someone has appointed this guy as the future savior of America, and all these guys are buying it, and and that's the part that I'm going. Where is that point? Where is that coming from? This is this is Tim Ballard receiving a priesthood blessing that he's going to save the universe. Yeah. From yeah, yeah. presumably Russell Ballard. Well, he got it from Tom Harrison and uh, and someone well, else. The uh, ones that we have copies of are from Tom Harrison, and they have all kinds of rhetoric like that. You will save the universe. But we also know that he received blessings from Elder Ballard. We don't know what was in those blessings. However... The Tom Harrison blessing refers to an apostolic blessing and then continues with that same kind of rhetoric. So a lot of us think it's very similar that he's a chosen one, you know, from on high. So it is kind of interesting. I don't know. I, I think I'd like to ask the question as we kind of wrap up here. To me, you mentioned, you know, they're they're putting Benson down, they're pushing him down kind of on an individual le level. They never came out to the entire body of the church and said, do not listen to President yeah. ben to Ezra Taft Benson. So I see that happening now. There's these little, you know, flare ups. These things happen of this this fundamentalism um, and the church stamps it down individually. You know, they denounce Chad Daybell. They denounce Lori Vallow. Of course, some of these involve, you know, atro atrocities. They denounce Julie Rowe. It's almost like whack-a-mole. But they're never going to come out over the pulpit and say, look, there are some dangerous ideas, you know, afoot in Mormonism. Beware. They'll never say that. They're just doing it very individually. And to me, that almost has schism written all over it. And Tim Ballard has kind of brought that to light. In my mind, you see this faction of people that say, we still support him. We still believe him. You know, the church statement is a lie. And then you see other people that say, oh, no, we've always known this. This was dangerous and crazy. The church, I guess they can't win by making any kind of statement because they alienate either side. I mean, is this textbook when you when you come across this this kind of fundamentalism and this Christian nationalism? And what could the church do? Is it dangerous? I guess I also wonder. Oh, heck yeah, it's dangerous. Yeah, that's what it's, I think. But, you know, it's profoundly unconstitutional, too. This mm -hmm. is a country that protects freedom and liberty and religious belief for all people. And for people to argue that that Christianity is privileged in this country. They have a profound ignorance of the constitution and our constitutional history. And so, um, so I, I get a little squeamish. That's the whole genius of this country is that we allow all religions to flourish and people who don't believe in anything, right? So when we're privileging Christianity, it makes me really, really uncomfortable because that's not what the founding fathers had anticipated. My first book was about the founding fathers in religion. So I have lots to say about this topic and anyway um it, it is dangerous that the church hasn't directly denounced these ideas and there's a number of people who espouse these these ideas and what's interesting is that this isn't always the case but when you espouse one crazy idea you also espouse 10 other crazy ideas right and this is again not always the case but you you see anti-vaxxers who of course they believe the election was stolen and you see folks like that who are plugged into OUR and all of that grift. And for me, the bigger issue would be that I wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, but I wonder if some of the brethren, did they recognize that this was a grifter, you know, before everything was exposed? And there, you know, there's some smart people. Valen Oaks is an intelligent human being. Jeff Holland's a smart guy. And I don't know how closely they're following Tim Ballard, but, you know, he's been around for a while. Desert Book had sold his crazy books in, in <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, I say crazy. I mean, really crazy that yeah. Abraham Lincoln's influenced by the Book of Mormon. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, and you had Lynn Packard out there for quite some time yeah. doing reports on him and several people that we've talked to said, 
uh, that uh, a lot of the organizations that dealt with this uh, with child trafficking were going something's wrong with this denouncing uh, yeah. away from him. So you yeah, there's some legitimate there's some legitimate organizations out there, and and sex trafficking is a real thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, there was just so many breadcrumbs along the way with OUR and what they were doing, and and I'm certain that we're going to learn more and. Mm -hmm. subsequent weeks with this lawsuit you know some of the details but i want to just uh, just i know we're running out of time here but i want to underscore something that's really really important and that's evidence mm -hmm. we in the united states today a number of people just sort of they believe whatever they hear uncritically right and the example that i give with my students sometimes when they ask me about it is that um former president trump made a statement in pennsylvania that the, they took ballots from the precinct and they dumped them out in the water, ballots that were for him. And I, I, so that's a factual claim. He said that you can go fact check it, right? So I asked my students, I said, you know, there's a number of issues with this. What, what do you, what, what would be an issue with this? And they said, well, there are poll watchers. And I said, okay, that's one, right? There are people in those precincts watching. It would be really hard to take a bunch of ballots in a bag, put them in the truck, an SUV, and not have anyone comment, right? There are cameras everywhere in these precinct rooms. It would be impossible to do it without security, right? Another person said, well, how do we know they voted for him? Well, that's a good point. How would he know that, right? And he claimed that they were dumped in the water. And my, one of my students says, well, geez, if that was true, people would get their phones out and they would take pictures of ballots floating down the water, right? You don't see any of this stuff. It doesn't even pass the smell test, you know? But the problem is, is that people don't ask those critical questions. They just sort of, they're in this, this bubble where they hear this stuff daily and they believe it. And, and so for me with, um, with white Christian nationalism, you know, when people talk about the constitutions like scripture, and I think it's a great document, but it is not scripture. I am so sorry. You know, it's a pro-slavery document. That, that There's nothing inspired about protecting the institution of slavery, right? And uh, anyway, but you, you have to have evidence. And so when people, when Christians, Christian nationalists talk about it being a Christian document, my response is, you know, go, go to Madison's notes. You, you'll see what influenced him. It is not the Bible. It is not Moses. And so you want to be able to get people to um, live their life so they can just make, to play by the rules of evidence, right? I would I would be so happy if there was a, a you know, comment that, you know, James Madison was quoting from the Bible or he was reading it, but it doesn't say anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do at the university is get our students to think about uh, subjects critically to ask questions because we all have opinions and that's fine, but we can't pontificate on on matters, especially important matters, without evidence. And so, and we also have to know where to find good evidence. And I tell my students a lot. I say, you know, if you're a conservative and that's your worldview, that's wonderful. Go to the best conservative sources out there. There's some really good conservative newspapers. The Wall Street Journal is as good as it gets. If you're a liberal, go to the Washington Post or New York Times. Those are as, as good as it gets, right? If you're a liberal. The problem is we we just sort of get indoctrinated by listening to sources that aren't credible. And when we listen to them, you know, day in and day out, that's it, it really affects how we approach the world and how we think. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think there's a lot of emotion tied up, you know, in patriotism in your country and then add to that. Mormonism, the Book of Mormon, it culminates maybe in Captain Moroni, you know, on the Capitol steps, waving a flag. That's what you what you have. You know, it's all wrapped up and they feel it. I mean, they really do. But I know schism is a word that I've heard tossed around a lot recently. So I don't know. Any final thoughts, Landon? We literally could go on all night about this because it's such an interesting topic. And I feel like we may have to do another episode. I don't know. This has just been absolutely fascinating and, and something I haven't heard talked about recently. And I think it's so important. It's almost like an inoculation to explain, you know, why this exists in Mormonism and, and what it might mean. Any final thoughts, Landon? I, I, I just really appreciated what Matt said because I mm -hmm. grew up, I went on my mission uh president benson was the the prophet mm -hmm. and 
I had no idea about this background. <laughs> uh, so completely open, you know, you, you come in and you, you're taught, Oh, this is the man you follow, uh, you know, which is concerning that you don't know the background of the person that you worship uh, or that you, you know, basically I'm going to do whatever this guy said. So I think it adds to the importance of, of, you know, fact checking these people before you elevate them. God oh. called them. You don't need to fact check them. <laughs> That's the problem. That's the caveat there. So, uh, well, it's been wonderful to have you on, Matt. You're just you're just a wonderful person, and you're so knowledgeable. And and I I would ask, could we possibly call you again at some time if we have something else we'd like to talk about? Of course, yeah, yeah. I think um, maybe when fine, yeah, you can ask me about anything. But definitely, you'll want to talk about the the priesthood ban and all of that. There's some yeah. In that yep. book, there is stuff yep. that has never been known or seen yep. before. No, and you told us a little bit about that. We had done an episode early on when we just started Mormonish a year ago and, you know, kind of dove in just a little bit. To, I think we called it something like the political infighting within the 12. We had no idea and we just scratched the surface. And this book coming out, we'll put links in the show notes so everybody can de- get this and we'll for sure have Matt. I'm sure Matt will do the circuit. <laughs> He'll go on Mormon stories first before us, but we'll get him. We'll talk to him about it and probably have him on book club because, yeah, it's really important to to understand why we are um here today at this point we've got to go back to the past and we've got to look and we've got to understand it you know with all the resources that we have and and matt certainly has those resources i mean he like you told us original sources or what was it that you told us again about the difference between sources i love that like you go oh, to the, it was such I, uh, a great I, thing I, I loved it yeah i like in sources to thanksgiving yes and as a historian we want the turkey the trimmings the yeah. dessert and then the turkey of course would be diaries letters yeah. first presidency meeting minutes and the the dressing would be you know enzyme articles and and newspaper accounts those are all important but yeah. the turkey is where it's at see this is perfect and it's it's a thanksgiving metaphor which we're coming up on thanksgiving so <laughs> we'll just say that matt has got the turkey on all of this okay everybody matt has got the turkey so that may even be our thumbnail land and we'll put a big turkey on the front that'll do it so. And, and you can see he's a great storyteller. Too. Yes. He really puts it in. Yep. Uh, it's just so accessible. That's it. it. So, yep. It's been a great episode. Thank you, everybody. Please leave us your comments. Were you raised in a Benthamite, Scalzanite, Bircher household like I was? <laughs> do you, you know, do you, do you have memories of this? Do you understand? Did you know any of this about President Benson? I think it's really worth talking about. Um, leave your, leave comments and, and tell us what you're thinking. Please like, and subscribe to Mormonish. And if you'd like to be made aware of when new episodes come out, you can hit the notification bell. Um, if you'd like to financially help and support Mormonish podcast, we have links in the show notes to um, PayPal and to Venmo, and we really appreciate all of our viewers and our listeners who do help support us. We just have so much. The best part, I'll tell you, of doing these podcasts is just meeting people like Matt and just learning so much. I think just expanding your mind and things that you hadn't really thought about before and then being able to connect with somebody who knows and can really walk you through it. So we appreciate all of you and we'll say goodbye from for now from Mormonish. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.